now recording and I'd like to welcome everyone to our Salmon Safe Agriculture Alaska workshop. We have some awesome folks here from Salmon Safe, Kevin Scriber, and then we have um, one of his uh, Farmer friends, who's also an avid fly fisher, um, Sager Small, he's with Walla Walla Valley Vineyard, and also the amazing Sue Mogger, our science director and executive director at Cook Inlet Keeper. And my name is Robbie Mixon. I'm the local foods director um, at Cook Inlet Keeper. And this is uh, one of the projects that we've undertaken um, uh, where food intersects with water um, is a pretty amazing place to talk about. But first I wanted to put in a plug for our Alaska Farmers Market Association, which is another local food project of Cook and Lit Keeper. Um, we'll be kicking off our virtual summit tomorrow. It's This is a pre-summit um, workshop and um, we hope folks will attend. It's a free summit all day um, and you can get details at alaskafarmersmarket.org. So I will start jumping into our Salmon Safe uh, workshop now. Um, let's see, I have a poll. Um, we may save the poll towards the end of the workshops when we have more people um, here, hopefully. Um, so we'll go over why we are looking at these salmon safe principles and land ethics now for Alaska. We'll hear about the basic principles from Kevin and then we'll learn some more from our um, expert witness here, uh, Sager from Walla Walla Vineyard. And then we'll have a discussion on what people want to learn more about, what they're already doing, um, and then kind of give you a preview of um, what we're hoping happens in the future. Okay, so why why the heck is Cook and Lit Keeper interested in salmon safe and local food? So um, we see uh, helping to build a resilient local food system that also appreciates and respects and preserves the landscape, the water and soil as a vital component to building these sustainable and healthy local communities and economies. So that's why we're doing it in a nutshell. Um, so when we think about um, food system and why we're interested in it. Um, so the food system um, is, well, sorry. Um, here's some fun facts about the food system and where it meets energy and water and climate change. So our food system as a whole is responsible for over one third of our greenhouse gas emissions. So when we think about um, the animal processing, the cooling, the heating, the transportation, all of the amendments that go into industrial agriculture, um, all of these things have a cost. So that's about, again, a, a third of the greenhouse uh, gas emissions. It uses about half of our world's um, viable land. So that's, that's quite a bit of uh, land use there and also accounts for 70% of our fresh water withdrawal. So that's that's a huge amount of water. So we want to make sure um, we are farming and producing food in ways that um, reduce the energy consumption, take care of our water. Um, again, in, in industrial farming is responsible for almost 80% of uh, eutrophication may not be saying the word exactly right, but um, algae blooms in the water calls from agricultural runoff. So um, you'll hear more about that, I'm sure, from Kevin and Sager here shortly. But uh, why, why Alaska, why now? Um, agriculture is growing in the state. During the last agricultural census that took place in 2017, um, that data came back that uh, Alaska is growing more so than anywhere in the nation. We're the number one state for um, agricultural growth, where most states we are seeing a decline, we're actually rising. <clears throat> and so now's the time to do it right. So uh, agriculture is a burgeoning industry. We have time to set some um, practices and land ethics that are going to protect our other 
natural resources like water and salmon. So of those, uh, of the farms in Alaska, um, the vast majority of them are small scale, which the USDA defines as under 10 acres. So um, the reason I mentioned this, it, it often makes it a little bit easier to implement some of these low cost environmentally friendly practices. Um, and like I mentioned other, uh, earlier, we do not want to trade our local food resources for um, another uh, local resources, uh, salmon and clean water. So I'll pass it over to Sue now. Thanks, Robbie. Um, so as someone who's been living on this landscape for about 20 years, um, with my consumer hat, I'm thrilled that we are having more local food production. But with my science cap on, I have some real um, concerns about how those that growing uh, culture that's happening here, particularly on the lower Kenai Peninsula, but across the state, how that will intersect with our water quality. And um, I also think a lot about climate change. And I think one of the reasons that we are seeing so much growth is because we are changing pretty dramatically up here. We've always had really long days, but now we have really warmer temperatures. And so we can really take advantage of those 19, 20 hours of daylight with that extra warmth. Um, and so, as many of you know, if you live up here, that we have seen really impressive um, changes in our climate. And so after the last 50 years, we've seen anywhere from three to six degree temperature increases in our air temperatures. Um, and those are, those are annual trends, right? That's not just summer, that's annual trends. So our winters are also getting warmer, although maybe not this year. Um, next slide, Robbie. Thank you. So here's a um, looking at just our summers, they also are clearly rising. Um, the last uh, 10 warmest summers happened in you know, more recent times. And uh, as anyone who was here in 2019, we really saw exactly how warm it could be. We actually saw temperatures that we didn't expect to see for another 50 years up here um, with temperatures in the 80s. So it is um, definitely changing. And you know, for the growing um, population, the growing sector, uh, next slide, Robbie. Um, that's resulting in some amazing growing degree day increases, right? So we suddenly, our shoulder seasons are actually really viable for growth. And so with the, um, the pulse of high tunnels that we had up here like about 10 years ago, it really created incredible opportunity for small scale growers. And um, so, so that's all great. But the reality is we need to make sure that we are not um, having problems with our water. That's great, Robbie, next slide, is talking about our water and the fact that we generally um, have pretty good water up here. Like we generally are not, uh, we don't tend to have drought very often. We, um, we generally anticipate that our precipitation is going to increase in the years ahead. We, uh, some places will be vulnerable to lower snowpack, which could be a problem, but overall we do expect that it will be a little wetter in the future. However, as we saw in 2019, that may not always be the case. And so 2019 was actually the first time that in Cook Inlet, we actually had a designation of extreme drought. And so, um, and it's almost, this could be actually a fire map because the areas that you see in red there were the, were the forests that basically burst into fire. So um, we know that we are vulnerable when things do dry out here. And certainly we did a bunch of um, conversations with farmers in 2019, and they were all talking about needing to develop new irrigation systems and had to really rethink their water because they hadn't really been planning for drought conditions to that extreme. So it really sort of changed the, the way they were thinking about the water on their landscape. Next slide. Um, so, so just to reiterate, like the, the increase in farming is linked to our changing climate. 
And uh, it, it's one of the, you know, we know that there are some long-term trends of warmth and maybe more uh, water in the landscape, but um, ultimately what climate change means is a lot more unpredictable conditions. And that's really hard if you are trying to plan, like, you know, buying your seeds in the fall and like trying to make your plans throughout the year when you have really a, a huge range of conditions that you could be facing um, during the growing period. Next slide. Um, yeah, so we even had, you know, do a, a tax relief um, because of the drought up here. Um, it, the, the peony farmers had a really interesting experience where their time of picking went from a month to about uh, 12 days. They had to pick everything so much faster than they ever expected. So we're having to invest in refrigerated trucks and things to um, really allow them to, to manage that real extreme uh, condensedness of their picking period. Next slide. So with all that in mind, one of the things in some of the conversations that we have with just general public folks, whether they're farming or not, is they're, not everyone understands that they are part of our water system, regardless of where they live in the watershed. And they have a connection to our salmon streams, whether they can see the open water from their house or not. And so this is a great um, illustration of that. This is a shot from um, a project that was done through the Ketchum Bay Research Reserve and a whole bunch of other folks through the State of Alaska's Salmon and People Project. And what this is showing you is, so the mapped salmon streams are those dark blue lines. So those are where we know we see salmon, uh, probably coho, uh, juvenile salmon have been located in those locations. And then the thin blue lines are clearly stream habitat, but there has, there's no documentation yet of salmon in those reaches. The white lines are the groundwater flow patterns where water is moving in the, sh the shallow surface and is moving just below uh, the crops or the house or all the things that are on our landscape and are bringing whatever is on that land down into your water. And so even if you live a mile or two from a river, you could be very directly connected to that river system. And I think that's really important to, to understand that you are part of the watershed and what you do on your, on your plot of land is connected to the health of the salmon stream. And that's why we feel it's really important to to you know, cast a really broad net in this conversation and to help people understand their connection and that they play a really valuable role as a steward of the landscape. Next slide. Do I pass this back to you now, Robbie? Oh, I can keep going, okay. <laughs> so a couple of years ago, Robbie and I got talking about this more, about the connection between water and, and salmon and local foods and, and what does it mean? How do we get out in front of the conversation to make sure that the broccolini and the sockeye salmon sit happily on a plate together? And so we started this um, kind of pilot project developing some outreach pieces about farming in our salmon landscape. And I've presented a poster in a few different places to try to get the conversation started. And this all comes out of ultimately, um, I'm finally tying it to, um, to Kevin here, is we've been having some conversation with the great work that the folks at Salmon Safe do. Um, and I had heard about work that they were doing up in the Mat Sioux around guidelines for Salmon Safe commercial development. And so we brought them into the conversation to talk about how could Salmon Safe be a part of our growing agricultural sector. And one of the first things that we realized is that we're probably gonna need, as with most things, we need to Alaskanize. Um, something that comes from another landscape needs to be Alaskanized because we do have a different climate, different soils. The way that people treat their soils um, to get it more productive is gonna be a bit different than places down in the um, Oregon and Washington. So that's one of the things that we're working 
um, in this next year is going to be working with Kevin to see what their, you know, to, to more fully dive into their salmon safe principles and then to work with our local farmers to Alaskanize them. And I think that will make it a much more valuable product for those who are actually trying to implement them. Next slide. So as the very briefest overview of what Salmon Safe is, um, as long-term stewards of the land, farmers can play a key role in maintaining healthy watersheds by optimizing water use, maintaining streamside vegetation and in-stream habitat, using long-term soil conservation techniques, and implementing nutrient and pest management practices to protect water quality. And so those are kind of the, you know, some of the high level look at, at what a farmer's role is in protecting water and soil and landscape. And so we go from a vision of this being a farm to this being a farm, where it is a vibrant place for all of the native species that live here and also a really um, productive farm and livelihood for Alaskans. And I think that's all we have for me. Uh, thank you, Sue. I, I did wanna give Sue a, a big um, shout out for her beautiful artwork that we just saw. Um, uh, so up next, I just wanted to give you guys a, a preview of, of what's coming up. Um, Kevin's going to go over some of the basic salmon safe principles, then we'll hear from Sager, and then hopefully we'll have time at the end from, for a discussion. So I'm going to quit sharing my screen now, Kevin, and if you have anything you would like to share or not, that is great. Okay. Oh, you were muted, Kevin. Me? How about now? Perfect. Okay. Hey, hi, Sager. Glad you're aboard. Um, so I'm going to try to do something that um, for an old guy is like like pretty amazing if I pull it off. I want to. I'm going to show a short video and then do a slide deck and then finish with a video and then hand it over to Sager. So let's see if I can do this. I want to do desktop. I want to pull. Yes, here we go. Let's see if I can do this. How am I doing, folks? Can you see that? Looks great, Kevin. Can, can you hear that? See it and hear it? Yes, sir. Wonderful. Okay, yeah. have fun. <laughs> Is sustainable, you know. This year, what's what we think is sustainable, next year we find out wasn't sustainable. But there's a big effort here on this land to restore the native habitat. We in this culture are so far removed from the land anymore that it's easy for us to forget that our food comes out of dirt. And so when we drive our cars or we pour something down the sink, we're not thinking about the connection, right? I, I want to know where my ingredients come from. And I want to know that they're, that they are handled in a reasonable and, and a sustainable and, and ecological way. Farmers do love their land. They need it <laughs> since their livelihood. And ecologists love the land um, because they recognize that we all need it. And uh, one of the things that I've really appreciated about this job and doing Salmon Safe and doing the restoration along the river is that we get to participate in, in the recreation of, of a new language, really. we're doing is trying to protect and preserve the natural ecosystem and feed folks good healthy food.
salmon is the is the canary in the coal mine. It's the indicator of how healthy a watershed is. The way that we've done business for the last hundred years, it's going to take us a hundred years to get out of this. And so we need to think long term in our goals. And when you plant a tree, the impacts for salmon habitat you may not see for a hundred years. Oh, this is where I live, and the salmon come home to where I live, and I want them to be healthy, and I want them to be abundant, and I want to eat them. <laughs> you know? see if I can stop screen share, come back. So folks, you will find that on the Salmon Safe website if you want to share it with uh, other folks. So now let's see if I can make the next move and um, go to, well, let's see, I want to do this. See if it comes up. There we go. How am I doing? All right, folks, can you see that? Um, no, I think you may have to click share screen. Do you see that option at the bottom? Oh, I didn't, I didn't do that. That's right, I went out of that. Okay, that's right. Okay, hang on. I'll come back to that. Yeah, I got out of, I got out of screen, there we go. Okay. Let me see. Okay, I want to do this. Perfect. And uh, let's see if I can pull this up. Come on, baby. Come to me, come to me. <laughs> so um, I knew I would have a, maybe have a, can you see that? Yep. Okay, I'll broaden it up and then put it into play. There we go. Perfect. Are we good to go? Yes, sir, it looks great. All right, okay. And you'll see, Robbie, that there's an end in my name. So it's not Scriber, it's Scribner. Um, so- oops, Sorry. <laughs> oops, oops on that, that's okay. So, um, you, so you mentioned 2019. So uh, here I was on the Nushakak River in Bristol Bay in 2019. And so I fished in Bristol Bay from 1980 to 2000. Um, and uh, I came back in 19 to help a friend, to help his son and, and, and grandkids uh, set up a set net camp on the Nush. And uh, yeah, it was delight, delightfully, well, disturbingly delightful. You know, from my time there in the in the late '80s and '90s, um, I was used to a lot of rain. You know, it was I was up there for uh, three plus weeks, and maybe 17 of those days there was no rain and a lot of sun. And yeah, it just was again, it was delightful, but it was disturbing. So, so things are changing. The other thing I want to say is that um, even though I'm an old old white bearded fellow now, when I first came up in the bay in 1980, I had, after having fished in Puget Sound in the Seattle area for four or five years, I, I did get that sense that you can still things, do things right in Alaska because the lower 48, the Puget Sound, the Columbia River Basin where Sager's Vineyard is, folks have, have farmed or, and done a lot of resource works for years without thinking about salmon. And so we're, we're having to do a lot of retroactive or a lot of restoration work. Whereas up in Alaska, you guys, you guys still have time, time to do it well, as you said, Robbie. So I think that's really, really important. I get ex very excited about that. And also this is to let you know that I'm a fisherman. I'm not, a, I'm not an agronomist, I'm not a farmer. And so I learn a lot from friends like Sager who will speak in a, in a bit here. 
So what, in terms of the ethic um, um, and, a, and a land and water ethic, you know, some folks in, uh, in the Portland area came up with a book called Salmon Nation. And I, and I like that as a way to talk about the area when you live where salmon are. Um, it's, it's, you actually live in Salmon Nation. And to me, that's, that helps us recognize that we are there, we are there with salmon. And so a constant reminder to live along with salmon. And uh, I, gave a, I gave a presentation uh, two years ago in Japan, and, um, and I reminded them that, um, that Salmon Nation actually is a huge international nation. It's international. And I, I let them know that there have been radio tagged uh, steelhead from the Columbia River that have been located off the coast of Japan. So, um, so it's, a, it's a vast area. And this is, the, this is the mission area, geographic mission area for Salmon Safe. And it's where, wherever Pacific salmon thrive, you know, live um, on the West Coast of the United States, including Canada. And so, um, and <laughs> amazingly so about uh, five years ago, I discovered I was in LA visiting the aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, and they had just started an, a permanent exhibit down there on a salmonid, a steelhead, which is part of the salmon family that is still alive on the LA River. So amazing. I just can't, you know, they, they've uh, come adapted to warmer, warmer temperatures, but that extended the salmon safe territory mission area all the way down to LA. And, uh, and then you know, this is what happens. Part of the salmon nation is aquatic. It's in the ocean. And so to be able to think about that, again, back to a land and a water ethic is we have to, you know, if we're going to, we're going to be with salmon, we have to wrap our minds around a vast, vast part of our planet. So Salmon Safe, um, you know, a lot of the, the chatter about Salmon Safe is actually certification. But certification is a strategy to achieve the mission, which is to transform land management practices so Pacific salmon can thrive in West Coast watersheds. So when Salmon Safe started in the 1990s, it was, about, it was the time when you also had other initiatives that were starting up for the marketplace, like Turtle Safe, Dolphin Safe. So that's how the kind of the language uh, came for Salmon Safe. It, it adopted that pattern. Um, one of the reasons why Salmon Safe looked to uh, the marketplace and third party certification um, as a mechanism and to use its incentives to inspire land managers is that a lot of the, sal the salmon life cycle happens on private land. And that's particularly uh, acute and important to note down in the lower 48, Pacific Northwest and California because it, with a lot of the headwaters or the, spinning, the spawning grounds for salmon are actually on public land, or maybe national forest or Bureau of Land Management, whatever. And those, those being federal agencies, they are actually required to pay attention to salmon. But uh, on the private, the private lands, both in urban and rural uh, farmlands, the salmon have to go through to get to their spawning grounds. That, that's where the, you know, we have to remind folks, again, particularly in lower 48, that, that um, to not only live alongside salmon, but actually welcome them back and to have, have practices that make the entire river systems uh, safe for salmon. And again, this may be a different message for you guys up on the Kenai, um, because again, I just want to re reiterate, it's so great to be able to start out, you know, start out well and we're working with salmon um, at, alongside salmon. But, but anyway, so I think it's really key that, you know, key component of the salmon safe strategy is to say to use market incentives to inspire land managers for, for, versus work on, on a kind of regulatory hammer uh, approach. So salmon safe, we have an interior vision um, that we, the mountains to ocean, because that's what the salmon, uh, the salmon life cycle includes the mountains to ocean. It would, and when uh, Robbie and Sue mentioned um, that we worked uh, with uh, folks in the Matsu Valley there, it was really exciting to me. I, I was up, up working with the folks there with that. 
um, to know that at, at the mountain at the headwaters of that Matsu Valley is Denali. So what, what a totemic valley to be in and to work with a totemic species. And so we're doing fairly well, I think salmon safe in the agricultural, the lower, lower elevation um, rural area. Uh, we're doing fairly well in the urban area and I'll, and I'll finish out with that. Uh, we've got some work to do in the estuary and near shore marine and, um, and also in the forestry area. But, uh, but with, the, with the farms in the urban area, I think Salmon Safe has got a lot of traction right now. And so fundamentally, this is what Salmon Safe means, you know, that folks, an area is being managed, responsibly managed, so it actually has a net positive watershed impact. Um, and so that's above, you know, above just sustaining the level of just, we're trying to, we're actually, actually set a, um, inspire um, as, um, a process of improvement. And, um, whoops, oh, doggone it. It was reminding me that I had, didn't do that, sorry. I'm working with a Mac. How are you doing? There we go. You still with me guys? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. So um, this, this list um, of our, our standards and the themes coincides with what Sue was mentioning before, Robbie and Sue has mentioned before. So these are the areas that we look at uh, for their influence on salmon. Um, and one of the ways I talk about salmon, you know, uh, I think it's just a really, it's, it's, it's a lot about uh, salmon safe, it's a lot about water quality. Um, and and w one way I like to characterize that is that's how land speaks to salmon. It's what comes off the land, if anything. So um, um, many of the salmon safe standards are about maintaining your, your land such that you do not have runoff, or if there is runoff, it's not toxic to fish. And we work very closely uh, with uh, ecotoxicologists to under, you know, be able to, um, uh, to tell us uh, uh, which chemistries are toxic to fish. Um, and then that informs us of how to work with landowners to be able to say um, um, either to try to diminish, if not eliminate the use of those chemistries or to use them in a way that they do not get into the water system. So what are the benefits of salmon safe certification? Um, so, much of the incentives come around the marketplace. And so um, I like to think about there you know, being a, a series of increased um, incentives or increased rewards, increased benefits. Because one, you can get market, we, we strive to help a grower with, this, with, the, with the label to be able to gain access to a market. And then in addition to that, once you gain access to the market to actually get more of what we call market share. So the, the marketer, retailer, uh, what have you, actually increases the amount of your product to be able to be sold. And then there's another level of uh, certainty uh, or, uh, um, benefit called market certainty, where the buyer will commit and ple pledge or commit to buying your product uh, over the course of years. So you get that con continuity. And uh, um, you, there's product differentiation. And then another one, if you can get a price premium, um, that's kind of the holy, holy grail as well. The signal to regulators. So this is what, what is um, uh, often a benefit in uh, the lower 48 Pacific Northwest is that we work closely with the federal agencies like NOAA Fisheries and EPA to be, able to, to be able to persuade them and convince them, and, and they are, that uh, they have been persuaded that the growers who are, are um, following salmon safe standards, meeting salmon safe standards, are actually in compliance uh, with uh, clean water and, and are contributing to um, salmon recovery, which is again, very important in the Pacific Northwest. So, at the same time, we make we 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 tell people we we are not a federal agency, um, but we work closely with them to because we feel that they can um, their signal of positivity back to a grower is important. Um, but also another thing is salmon safe. Any interchange of information with salmon safe is totally confidential, 
So there's no you know, sharing of information to, uh, to regulators. And lastly, operational efficiencies. We believe that if uh, a, an operation looks um, at the salmon safe standards, whether they become certified or not, it will help them understand how to um, um, develop efficiencies and more effectiveness, and particularly going back to that fundamental uh, goal, which is to how, how can we live alongside salmon? We've got um, standards that uh, work in this array of, not, uh, of arenas, not just the uh, farms and the vineyards that you see at the bottom, but a whole variety of the urban area too. And, and when I make uh, presentations to growers in the lower 48, and I talk about salmon safe working in the urban area, they get really, they, that pleases them because often growers um, uh, I feel like they're getting all of the burden of, of responsibility to bring salmon back. And when they realize there's a, there's a responsibility within the urban area, they, they appreciate that because you know, everybody's got to work together for salmon. So here's just a, a series of um, um, uh, de you know, demonstration of where Salmon Safe has uh, been operating. So this is a this is a um, a large vineyard, much larger than Sagers. We will talk about this is Chateau Saint Michel, which is the seventh largest winery group in the world. Um, they have uh, a lot of acreage in the Columbia River uh, Basin, which is uh, west of where Sagers Vineyard is. But uh, Chateau Saint Michel has committed their estate vineyards to uh, be Salmon Safe. And this is, a, this is an event we did a long time ago in 2013. Um, um, I ended up uh, supplying the salmon for the winner of this, just, uh, um, um, this contest. And it was actually a, a woman in Virginia uh, who, was, who, who uh, uh, buys Washington wine. And uh, she was very, very pleased to get a year's worth of salmon. Um, this, is, this is the, you'll see right here, uh, the eco label, the, the, the logo for Salmon Safe. Um, and um, I don't want to take any thunder away from Sager, but I was talking to his dad, Rick, a number of years ago. And uh, Rick, who's on, you know, done marketing and across the country and even Japan, he just says it's very, very clear that that Salmon Safe logo with two salmon is just instantly recognizable and instantly conveys a sense of, of place and, and, and nature. This is a um, distribution um, um, vehicle in uh, the Willamette Valley, which is south of Portland, Oregon. Willamette Valley and Vineyards is also a, it's been for years uh, a great supporter and uh, been salmon safe uh, vineyard. So we get this kind of display wherever they go to deliver their wine. Um, we also have wallet cards um, that we put out and this is for Walla Walla and you'll see um, uh, the second from the bottom is Woodward Canyon Winery. Uh, that's Sager's um, uh, vineyard, estate, estate vineyard. Good friend of mine, Ron Brown, uh, orchardist, uh, apple guy. Uh, he's an avid uh, uh, supporter. And these are the kind of uh, uh, ads we try to help, you know, uh, uh, provide to growers um, with a bit of a whimsy. And we actually did do that. We created um, a little stick them to go on the apples that had the salmon safe label on it. It was, it was really, it was cute. Uh, we work in, uh, in the row crops. Um, there's a, a company uh, um, called Organically Grown Company in the Pacific Northwest. They have, um, their brand is the Ladybug brand. Um, they are organic, organically grown company. That's their um, um, buyer brokerage name. They buy from uh, farmers. About Seven years ago, they decided that organic was not sufficient, that they needed to make a statement as a brand about uh, how their growers operate in, a, in, a, in the watershed as well, not just looking at the inputs, which organic um, uh, focuses on, but the outputs from land, uh, their land. So they are organic and um, salmon safe. Um, another good, uh, an array of products that Salmon Safe has, has certified and has a play in the marketplace. Um, beer, you know, we're, um, it's, it's the, the, the beverage industry is just really, really, you know, they've really embraced to a great extent Salmon Safe. 
Um, cause they're, it's a labeled product, you know, the wineries, wine bottles have a label, beer has a story. The distilleries are coming on strong now with salmon safe. So anything that has a, can be labeled and have a story. Um, that's a great, great profile and, uh, uh, platform for salmon safe. You saw Gail on the, on the video that we're showing. She's a hop grower in, uh, and vineyard uh, grower in uh, the Willamette Valley again, south of Portland. She's been an avid uh, she, supporter from Salmon Safe from the get-go. Um, Roy Farms, this is also hop growers. This is in the Yakima area, west, uh, east of Seattle. Um, and I think, you know, 70% of the hops that are grown in uh, this in the United States are grown in, the, in that Pacific Northwest. So they've, they've been a great um, area to recruit growers. And then um, this is another great data point. Um, and so, you know, they, another indicator of how this farm sector has appreciated and embraced salmon safe. Um, IPA, this is a, uh, we had a uh, IPA Salmon Safe Festival three years ago in, uh, in, in Portland and the city council declared this to be that day that when the festival happened uh, was uh, Portland recognized it as the official Sam Salmon Safe IPA Festival Day. Um, um, this is Sal the Salmon that often comes out to uh, our events and to the right, uh, the fellow in the shorts with the sunglasses, Christian Edinger, he owns the brewery where we're at and he's also on the Salmon Safe board. Um, and just simply, this is the, you know, a, a very clear, just simple message, you know, support businesses that share your values upstream and downstream, both upstream and downstream on the watershed, uh, entire watershed. watershed. And this is uh, some of Christian's uh, um, uh, products that he's put out there that, uh, that he's also 1% for the planet. So he's just full on in support of uh, the salmon and, and water world. We also, um, I, I mentioned the urban side of things. Um, we've got, we've been working with the Portland Park System since 2002 to be certified. Now we're working with the Seattle system um, to do this park system for the same. And uh, within the urban area, it's really about stormwater management. And, uh, but that last key point there, develop incentives to promote beyond compliance with stormwater management is that to get to that net positive, you know, that net positive benefit impact to the watershed. And, you know, at least get to net zero and then get to a positive uh, net positive. Nike uh, campus, the urban uh, headquarters campus, or campus to become salmon safe certified. And uh, we've got this whimsical uh, pro, you know, pro bono um, uh, marketing uh, crew that helps us out. And they developed this, uh, this uh, um, graphic, which was run on bu uh, bus sites in Portland. Um, you'll see this is Seattle. For those of you who are familiar with the Seattle landscape, South Lake Union. Um, this is uh, co-founder of Microsoft, Paul Allen, um, has, been a, has been a passionate supporter of Salmon Safe and his, um, his, his um, land management company, uh, Vulcan, they have committed everything that they own, every piece of property they own um, will be, will or it is or will be Salmon Safe. So, it's, so Paul, uh, while he was alive, unfortunately died three years ago, um, has really, really help salmon safe in the urban world. Um, and then when you get to work with uh, that area of South Lake Union, um, there's Amazon there, and then the Google campus gets in. So this enabled us to get out to, you know, to be able to um, have inroads to the other um, IT world that's, uh, that's populated in the Seattle area right now. So I'll just finish with a, uh, this is what it's all about, you know? Um, um, just, you know, this is one of my favorite shots from Bristol Bay, you know, these beautiful scarlet red salmon on their way to spawn. And, uh, you know, another great shot, you know, so just, you know, this, this just gives me heart, you know, it just keeps me inspired to keep going. And I love to show these pictures to folks in, down in the in, in lower 48 or outside as you guys often refer to say, this is the way it was, it used to be. And, and let's, let's see if we can get it, 
you know, anywhere near close to what it was. But again, you guys, you guys got it now, you know. So let's let's keep keep the fish there and uh, do some growing. And then good old Ray Troll from Juneau, Southeast, you know. Um, uh, I love to show this because, you know, Ray's got a way of, uh, again, whimsically just calling it what it is. And then got to finish with this, of course, got to finish with this. So, um, you know, it's not only us that like to eat salmon, but, uh, but there's a lot of, lot of other creatures out that do. Okay, Robbie, Sue, and now I'm going to try to do one more magical thing. I'm going to try to get out of this and finish with a, aha, okay, oh, something went wrong, come on, I guess I held that, I may have to, I may have to come back with this, um, which I think I will, because I don't want to keep, um, so I'm going to stop sharing, and at that, I'm going to hand it over to, uh, to Sager, and pick up the mic and talk about what it's like from the grower's perspective. Yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Everybody, yep. am I coming yep. in? Yeah, all right. Perfect. Yeah, gotcha, Sager. Uh, yeah, well, first, uh, I'd say thanks to uh, everybody that spoke before. Um, I think I'm in, I'm in the right, <laughs> in the right uh, chat. <laughs> um, I guess um, it would probably make more sense for me to just give a little bit of background um, about myself. So um, um, I'm born and raised in Walla Walla, Washington. And so that's not exactly the Washington that people really um, imagine. They think probably Seattle, but we're actually the um, southeast corner kind of with our back up against Idaho. Um, we're, uh, we're a valley. We have... Um, mountains to the east and then pretty arid climate to the west so um we're about four hours from seattle or four hours from portland so we're kind of in that back corner of the state um and um the mountains to the east are going to probably come up later in regards to a little bit about our watershed and how the water moves through um the walla walla valley but um so just a little bit of background um Born and uh, born and raised in Walla Walla, um, I worked in Seattle as a, uh, a cook, back of house for about ten years, and then um, I met my wife, and we moved back to Walla Walla to um, uh, work for my um, family's company, Woodward Canyon Winery. Um, there, uh, just a little history about them: um, small winery, we'd be considered boutique, ultra premium. Um, it was established by my dad and we were bonded in 1981. So before I was born, he had this winery going um, and he's something of a hippie himself. So he's been um, been more or less conservation minded um, when he planted the vineyard. And just a quick aside, what you're seeing behind me, my background is a view of the vineyard. Um, I believe this is looking south, but um, as you can see, kind of arid. Um, so once I moved back to Walla Walla, um, begun um, working with the family business. Um, I also enrolled in uh, the Walla Walla Community College's um, Enology and Viticulture program, which is grape growing and winemaking. Um, it's got a nice little reputation within the state. Um, took a lot of classes there um, with more of a focus on um, viticulture, growing um, soils classes, plants classes. Um, a little more um, in depth um, and uh, continued working at the winery, um, doing production and um, kind of one toe in vineyard and viticulture at the same time. Um, and while this was going on, um, a friend of mine introduced me to fly fishing in the area with oddly enough, I had not really done that on the west side when I lived um, on the wet half of the state. Um, so, um, you know, I kind of started fly fishing and really took to that. Um, and then pretty soon I started, um, you know, kind of looking for a little bit more of a community, um, in Walla Walla, it's not, not known for its fly fishing, but there's some little streams there. Um, so I, um, got involved with Trout Unlimited and, um, small little chapter, unfortunately it's kind of dissolved at this point. 
but um uh really from that point on i'd say that conservation and understanding that that frontier of agriculture and um in our case, you know, some really critical habitat, um, started to understand the importance of those two things um, and, and that land where they overlap about how important that is. Um, and was really lucky to just meet some really interesting people um, through both sides. I mean, Kevin and a good friend of mine, um, Eric Hoverson, who worked um, as the uh, fish biologist for the Confederated Tribes of the um, Umatilla Reservation just over the border into Oregon. So some really cool people. Um, and that's kind of informed a lot of my um, opinions as a farmer um, in regards to salmon safe. And so it uh, made a lot of sense for me to start um, engaging more with salmon safe. Um, and uh, I believe my dad, I think Kevin might have to have, the, <laughs> Kevin might have to fill me in, but my dad has been working with salmon safe I believe for at least a decade now. So um, we've, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm getting the thumbs up. So yeah, um, so it's been kind of a long-term relationship so far. And um, I mean, we really like it. My dad likes it. Um, it's been something that works really well for us. So um, I have a couple of points that I'm just gonna work off of here. Um, and kind of the prompt that we were given, you know, it's kind of why is it important? Uh, I think that's a pretty easy question for us to answer. I mean, for the family and for the winery, um, I mean, it's just a professional and a personal ethos of ours to just practice good stewardship of the land as, as best we can. Um, and kind of also what the speakers earlier kind of touched on is I do think that, uh, I mean, as a family, we all think that you vote with your money when you consume food or you consume, um, you know, alcohol, anything, you're still voting with that money and you want to put it in places that you support the culture there, um, uh, whatever that culture is. And so we've always thought that conservation made sense for us. Um, and I guess I have to go into a little bit of the topography of Walla Walla Valley just really quick. So, um, Mountains in the east, all the, the entire watershed essentially drains down um, and runs along the border of Washington State and Oregon, essentially until it hits the Columbia River. So although behind me, um, that vineyard, it looks really arid. And in fact, we are pretty arid climate. I think we get about 12 to 10 inches of rain a year. It's going to be pretty different <laughs> than, than Alaska. Um, uh, you know, so it looks really arid, but just beyond the vineyard, uh, maybe like even a mile, um, there is the Walla Walla River, which is quite close to us. So we look really aired, and we are, but we uh, have rivers on both sides, actually. The Tushi River and the Walla Walla River pretty much go around us, and they all go into the same drainage um, and go down into the Columbia. So Although we are arid, it is actually really important for us. We have a few ephemeral streams on site as well that I'm sure at one point drained into the Walla Walla. It looks like downstream there in the middle of a, um, uh, an uh, annual, annual monocot field right now. Um, but you can see the streams were there at some point. So um, we kind of keep that in mind, uh, although we do not have any, you know, <laughs> water or salmon habitat on site, we're still like the, like Sue said, we're still in the drainage. Um, and that stuff is all going to go one place eventually. It's all going to end up in the Walla Walla River, um, subsequently the Columbia. Um, so, I mean, part of our ethos too is it's always just been easier to work with the environment than to work against it. Um, and we see this in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, unfortunately, we're farming in a, a really dry area. Um, it's good because we get the growing degree days, but um, that means we have to use our irrigation. Um, really deliberately and salmon safe and follows in some of those guidelines of us um you know being more judicious with our water and trying to prevent runoff whenever we can and you know this is all stuff that generally if you're farming you're gonna really want you're gonna want to keep your stuff on site 
Um, if, if we're leaking nitrogen and eutrophying bodies of water, that's not ideal for us either because um, we like to keep our nitrogen in the root zone, if at all possible. <laughs> um, um, uh, okay, so, and then just briefly on like the barriers and challenges, um, you know, I think so far I've done, um, I've, I've certified live and I've certified Oregon Tilth Organic and Salmon Safe. And, you know, honestly, I can say that the paperwork and the forms are not that difficult, you know, um, <laughs> you know, uh, kind of getting things together. But I think as a farmer and as someone who's um, going to have, if I'm going to be growing on this land, I think it's all kind of things that you'd want to be aware of anyway. You'd want to be paying attention to your erosion. You would want to be paying attention to your applications. Um, I mean, it's in your best interest to make sure you're getting the best out of your applications as well, because I don't think any farmer really wants to be spraying stuff around to have it um, go off site or not work really well. I think that's in, in every farmer's best interest um, to, to just pay a little bit more attention to what they're doing. But um, I mean, I think in general, anytime you ask a farmer to change anything, there's probably going to be an adjustment phase there. But I think that most of the salmon safe things that we've been working on, I think are all kind of, for me, kind of fall into that like com kind of common sense category because um, a, it comes with um, being in an arid climate. We're also very susceptible to wind erosion. Um, so, uh, I mean, farms that there's farms tilling and, you know, if you get a breeze, you can lose a lot of topsoil. Um, same with roads, you know, kind of keeping sources of wind erosion down as best we can helps us and we're not covered in dust. And the dust also can contain uh, mites that can get on grape leaves and uh, cause injury. So again, that's something that is a uh, salmon safe standard and it benefits us kind of a, it, there's a collateral benefit there for us. Um, let me see. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, so just generally, I mean, the, yeah, I mean, engaging with Salmon Safe for us has been pretty easy. Um, and where we have, um, where we're seeing, where we're having difficulties or, or we need to work on a certain area, we've been given help to do that. And then we kind of check and confirm and move forward. And so that's been helpful for me as this has been my first time, um, first time signing or first time uh, really uh, doing, the, doing the whole process ground up where before it was my dad. So all the paperwork, um, all the photos, all the information, um, all the chemistries, you know, all the assessments of high erosion areas and potential um, runoff. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it's been a pretty rewarding process for me as far as that goes. Um, uh, so I think next, um, you know, kind of the benefits for us where we see it, again, I'd probably echo what Kevin said about, um, the marketplace, how having having that symbol on our bottles, a lot of people actually know, especially when we're in Seattle or Portland and Pacific Northwest, people know what it means as well. Um, our biggest export is Japan. And so um, it just kind of makes sense if you live around salmon and you understand a little bit of the ecology that that's something you should probably <laughs> should probably um, be taking care of or be thinking of um, while you're doing business. Um, 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 and yeah, I mean, I have stories, um, that I could tell, I don't know about, <laughs> about how I'm doing for time, but, um, you know, the, in to incentivize, you know, protecting habitat and biodiversity, luckily that's something that's kind of been ingrained in our business from the beginning when my father started the vineyard. He um, had the foresight to put in, you know, I think what amounts to, we're about a 41 acre or 40 acre operation. And he put in probably um, 
about five acres um, inside the vineyard and then a couple more acres outside the vineyard of um, kind of just trying to reintroduce the native species of uh, Western juniper, ponderosas, uh, silver rabbit brush, green rabbit brush. And we also brought in um, some Columbia Basin specific um, uh, wildflowers and things, things like that kind of mixes that were around. And a lot of them, um, I think we irrigated for one year and the rest just took and they're all, just, you know, huge, um, huge, um, what's the word, uh, huge root, <laughs> large rooted, uh, <laughs> kind of pra prairie desert, um, um, plants, uh, really kind of take, uh, take hold out there. So, um, having that habitat there, I mean, I, again, it's something we're already doing, but incentivizing it is really where we want to be. Um, and just, uh, I mean, I think kind of to wrap it up, unless there's questions, I think the thing that, again, the thing I like about Salmon Safe is personally, my personal, I personally believe that if you want to farm now and if you're going to be a farmer, especially as the climate keeps changing and we're seeing some of these finite resources um, appearing very finite, like the salmon in Washington state, you know, we're having to really, we're having to really wake up to the fact that we probably need to do something. Um, or else it's going to be really hairy into the future. I think that if we're going to farm now, you need to kind of have that, you need to be thinking almost in an ecological way. Uh, I mean, I, I think there's a lot of farmers, I mean, it might be hard for a lot of farmers um, to, to make that sea change, but I mean, I think moving forward, we're going to have to um, be doing more things like this and just thinking why we work and Honestly, I see a lot of them make my job easier as well as a grower. Um, so, yeah. And I guess I, I can answer questions if there's any questions that anybody has. Hey, thanks, Sager. Really appreciate it. Um, and uh, yeah, your dad's been there, I think, since 2004, 2005. So he's he's been at it a, a, a good long time, but I think as as you indicate your dad just from the beginning you know from when he when he planted the vineyard you know or just had he had a vision in mind that he wanted to do and that's i think that's resonant so much about what we're hearing from the kenai up there is that now you have the chance to to begin in a, with a with a good foot forward so very exciting very exciting so yeah i mean it's kind of it's you know it's weird looking at the old photos because we're an old Walla Walla is essentially an old frontier town. And so you can still see the old pictures of the guys in, you know, the late 1800s with the stringers of steelhead. And, you know, I mean, they just, they kind of, you know, they built a lot of dams and cut off a lot of runs and, you know, people farm like right up to the river's edge and, you know, it's hard, you know, still stuff. It's, you know, with no riparian area, you'll see them just, yeah, it's, it's hard, you know, and then, and then they're the same. They're going to be upset when they start seeing some, you know, some erosion and, you know, kind of goes with the territory, but. So folks, folks who are listening from our, or attending, participating from the Kenai up there, uh, remember Sager loves to fly fish. And so um, he may be able to kind of barter some wine for a fly fishing trip. So keep, keep, keep that incentive in mind. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, as long as the LCB isn't here, I'm willing to trade. <laughs> I'm willing to negotiate uh, wine for uh, uh, fishing. So back to you, Robbie and Sue. Well, this is our question and answer um, time in our uh, workshop here. So um, if anyone in the audience wants to just feel free to unmute yourself or you can type your question in the box. And if there's no, no questions, I think Sue and I might be able to come up with a few. Bobby, do you want to do a poll? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's do our poll. Um, all right, I'm going to launch our poll. You can, is everybody able to see that? And there's just 
four, three questions in there. And I'm going to give you 15 more seconds to do the poll. And, we'll and also, Robbie, when I looked at the participant list, it looked like there was somebody from the local newspaper that was on from the Clarion. Uh -oh. Like oh, yeah, Ashlyn. Yeah, great. Great, great to have the media here. Hey. <laughs> hey there, Ashlyn. <laughs> I'm glad we were on our best behavior. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to end the polling and we can take a look and see what uh, folks responded with. Um, so most people um, of, of the five that responded to our poll um, were vaguely aware and one person had never heard of it. So I, I will admit up until uh, Three or four years ago, I'd never heard of it. I have seen the symbol though in in Seattle and in Portland, and and was always curious, but not curious enough to investigate. I'm glad Sue brought it to my attention. Um, let's see what type of participant we have: two farmers and three interested citizens and consumers. Um, and then we have uh, most folks from Kenai Peninsula, but we have Southeast and Southwest. Um, as well so well, who's who's there from southwest where in southwest kodiak ah okay okay great is there you got some growing going on um, in kodiak what's, what's, what's the soils like there uh <laughs> pretty much clay based um very small farms i i don't think there's a whole lot of impact to the to the riverine systems, but I'm just really curious to see what's going on in the Kenai. Yeah. Brian is a, is an amazing fisheries uh, guru. I, I don't even know how to even describe you, Brian, but I'm super happy you're here. Just a retired faculty member, that's all. Yeah. Well, I think if you're, if you're in the fisheries world, you're a renaissance person, you know, because you got to <laughs> You got to think about a lot of things. It's a systems or orientation, right, Brian? Very true. Yeah. One of the things, Sue and Robbie, that I wanted to echo that, um, and it's when you said it, Sue, about um, trying to Alaskanize, you know, Salmon Safe, which is, I think that I just really embrace that. And um, because we're, um, I think it's Salmon Safe at being at a watershed, you know, thinking about in terms of watersheds and watersheds are different everywhere. And Salmon Safe is actually a very, very small in terms of staff organization, but the way we've been able to um, move across the landscape, um, working entire Columbia River Basin, Oregon, Washington, um, at times in California is through local uh, place-based partners. So very excited about that's why to being invited by the, uh, the inlet keepers to come up and make these, you know, get, get uh, more and more relationships going. And, and I think that's also what will be very helpful in the future, should there be interest in moving into um, a certification, um, you know, to activate a certification program. And I'll just say, you know, should there be interest? Because as I mentioned too, is that, just even becoming aware of the salmon safe standards, like the Matsu did for residential, it can be guidelines. You know, it doesn't. You know, it it can help be just just be informational and guidelines. But should there be interest in going ahead in um, um, certification, then I th think that's where we would look to inlet keepers and any, any other folks to be able to. You know, you guys host that because we we it's almost like we have franchises everywhere. We, we have a a quote unquote salmon safe franchise in, in British Columbia where they run the program. 
And, uh, um, and so it's not us having to go up there to BC and whatever, have, not having to go up to Alaska. So I think that that is a very, that's, that's a very rich way to move forward um, in our point of view. And Kevin, there's a great question in the chat. Um, can you give a description on, or, or Sager, um, a description on the certification process, um, how is it paid for, and then what do the uh, farm visits look like? Well, I'll, I'll give the bare bones of it and then let Sager do some color commentary. Um, and so the, you know, the, the salmon safe cycle is a three year cycle for farms. And the, the first year initiating year um, is involves an assessment or audit by an independent third party certifier who is very knowledgeable about the standards. And so, so that auditor comes and visits the farm or the operation, what have you, works with uh, the landowner, the op, you know, the manager, and uh, and they make their evaluation of the operation in, in, in regards to achieving salmon safe standards, and then we get the report from that uh, that evaluation, and that keys us to move forward. And there, there are actually uh, uh, two ways to, to move forward in salmon safe's um, world is one is to really move clearly forward with clear um, um, certification. As well, we recognize that there can be certification with conditions. And so what we wanna do is also have kind of a, you know, uh, uh, the within keeping integrity, but also realize some folks, some operations need a little entry, you know, kind of a lower entry place to be able to get in. But so we will certify them on, on, on condition that they meet X, Y, and Z. And that's an agreed upon uh, process. But to the outside world, that operation is certified salmon safe. So what we want to do is be able to provide a, 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 an, e you know, an easier pathway to, to engage folks. So back to the process. Year one is that independent audit. Year two is reporting. Year three is uh, reporting. Um, and then year four, the three, um, the three year cycle starts again. And what Salmon Safe does is, is with the farms um, in, um, in uh, the farm operation in the lower 48, is we basically, um, we don't at this point in time, don't charge any administration fee for the certification. So the certification covers the cost of the audit. And that's, that will be the cost for the three years. So if you have, and that can range anywhere from 500 to $1,500 or even more than that, depending on the size and the complexity of the operation. But that's also, you can look at that as one cost to be able to parse out for three years. So that's kind of the, the skeleton of it. Uh, Sager, do you have any uh, thing to um, add to that? Yeah, uh, are we, do you also want to talk about um, the Walla Walla Valley? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good example of how Salmon Safe can work with a, with a specific uh, area. Yeah, so um, just Kevin and I um, have been working with um, uh, like a small smaller group of folks in Walla Walla Valley and we're, essentially kind of building a certified sustainable program like built off of Salmon Safe. It's kind of like our base model that we're building it off of. Um, um, I think one thing I'd like to add about Salmon Safe is I, I got the feeling that it was kind of a progressive kind of structure as well, where there's room, you know, there's kind of, it seemed like there's room to kind of improve every year if you're able to. And um I mean, I think that makes it easier for people. Yeah, and I think there, there's a one way to describe that, Sager, is I think per, Salmon Safe is performance oriented. You know, it's not prescriptive. And so a prescriptive operation would be just kind of yes or no, you do it or you don't, yeah. you know. And but Salmon Safe uh, realizing that it is, a, it is a dynamic situation and it's you, you, you um, are trying to achieve the standards. Um, and as well, salmon safe, we realize we're not agronomists, we're not growers. We can set the standard and they are peer reviewed by, uh, by scientists, 
but it's the growers like Sager that will figure out how to achieve those standards. So we don't want to tell a grower how to grow necessarily. You know, we will tell them, oh, you know, you know, give them some guide. The standards will act as guidance. So I think that's another way of saying, as you said, Sager is progressive in that way. And then let me echo back to what Sager, when Sager brought up, the Walla Walla Valley Certified Sustainable. So this is, I collaborated with uh, the group that Sager belongs to, if he and his dad, it's called Vinaya Sustainable Trust. So the, that's the vineyard group in Walla Walla. And they wanted to have their own place-based certification, um, but have salmon safe embedded within it. So we worked together and we just this year, this, uh, this over the winter and this spring, launched the pilot certification you know, evaluation of that. And, and Sager's Vineyard was one of the pilots on this. So what, what that means then is that because the, and it was third party evaluator, we had, a, we had an auditor that was familiar with the salmon safe world. And then Vinaya chose to add a, a soil standard to that is the, the auditor was familiar with both, uh, both uh, the salmon safe and also could, could uh, uh, evaluate to the, to the soil standard. So what we have now is, is um, Sager's vineyard and uh, um, can be, it will be both. It can be, wall, it is Walla Walla Valley certified sustainable, but at the same time, it's salmon safe certified. And that's, a, but that's another way to actually localize what you're doing, Robbie and Sue. So if you wanted to have keen eye sustainable, something like that, which, which, which may mean something more to get it localized it. It may mean more to people in, uh, in Anchorage, what have you. Um, but, but, uh, but you can do that and have salmon safe embedded right in it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was important for us as well. Um, because in the past, I believe we had got our salmon safe certification through live. And the problem, um, I think my dad had, um, you know, um, kind of disillusionment with live because a lot of it was ran out of um, the Willamette Valley. And Walla Walla is a very different growing region. And kind of the consensus among uh, wine growers out here with, was, you know, they were kind of grading us on a Willamette Valley curve. Um, and it, we're just drastically different. Um, we have absolutely different pressures. Um, you know, they don't necessarily have to irrigate and we are obligate irrigators. Um, and, you know, they're pretty much worried about mildew and there's just absolutely different pests. And so it was important for us to retain the salmon safe certification, but also, yeah, I mean, localize it. And I think that actually is more important yep. because to say, to just give a blanket rule, I mean, there's, they're not going to be the same. Um, it's not the same land. It's not the same ecosystems. I mean, the watersheds, a lot of those are pretty similar, you know, kind of, <laughs> I feel like a lot of the kind of safeguards you want to, those are pretty, those don't change too much, but um, as far as, you know, the soil and the, that's all different. Even the structure of the clay soils, uh, you know, we're, we're just all silt and less. And, you know, it's going to be different everywhere you go. So it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. To echo what Sager's saying is, you know, when Sager uses the word live, that's a, it's low input viticulture and enology. That's a certification program that's based out of the, that area south of Portland. And, and south of Portland, it's moist and cool. That's the growing climate in there. And as Sager said a number of times, they're hot and arid. And so it just, you know, it, it, it more and more with the, what Sager and his colleagues found out is the live approach because it was so informed by a moist, cool growing regime, it just wasn't fitting for Walla Walla. So that's for Robbie and Sue and, and you all you up there in the Kenai, that's just another, you know, affirmation of what you're talking about is to, is to Alaskanize the program. And there was a question about how many uh, farms, I think there's over 200 uh, vineyards uh, that are now certified uh, um, salmon safe, um, much of it through the live program. Um, we're making um, 
uh, we're getting a lot of uh, acreage, not many farms yet, but acreage in the grain world. Um, and and those those farms are large. You know, the, the, you know, the Walla Walla has a number of, um, I think we're, we're close to 15,000 acres of grain in the Walla Walla area that's certified uh, salmon safe. And what's helping to certify the grain world is um, a business that just started up a couple, um, a young couple and family there, it's called Mainstem Malt. And they're a craft malter for the beer industry and the distillery industry. And they've committed, they will only use salmon safe grain in, uh, in, in, their, in their supply chain. So Mainstem, it's a Mainstem river, you know, it's stuff like that. So they're, they're using that um, that branding um, and want to have it affirm, uh, be affirmed by uh, Salmon Safe certification. I have a question um, about, so Sager, we're probably going to have a lot of new farmers. You know, we're increasing in our number of growers. And so in some cases, somebody might have a one high tunnel and then suddenly they decide they're going to go for it. And in one summer could completely transform their property. What, in thinking about the types of things you have to be aware of for the salmon safe certification process, can you maybe highlight, like, is there anything that you would have, um, if you had known all of these things before, are there things that you would have done different? Are there like decisions that you wish if you had done it this way, it might not have been so hard to kind of retrofit it later. You know, what are the important things for a new farmer? Um, I mean, it, I get, again, um, I mean, I can speak to some of ours, but, uh, you know, I think it's going to be also, it's going to be site specific, but um, I mean, honestly, I feel like if you are starting out and you have some of the standards in mind, um, I think, like I said, when I was speaking, it would be helpful, I think, in the long, it would be helpful in the long run, because these are all kind of things that I think that if you were going to try to operate in a sustainable way as a farmer that you'd probably want anyway. Um, but I mean, I guess in, in regards to our site, um, you know, where we're not as worried about specifically runoff as we are more of the soil um, more of the soil stuff and the um, biodiversity kind of side of it. Um, maybe just the, you know, some work a little bit harder on a cover crop. Um, we're lucky because we are a woody perennial. So we get to keep a lot of the soil down um, and we get a pretty good bio crust on places where we're not riding our tractor. Um, but I mean, I think just some of the roads and, um, maybe having a more robust cover crop, uh, some things like that um, would, would have benefited us, I think, coming out. But I mean, that's why I think, you know, work in conjunction with the standards um, and you'll probably thank yourself later. <laughs> <laughs> did, I, did I answer the question? Yeah, no, I, I mean, cause it may take a while before we, we get enough momentum to actually develop the certification program. But it seems like there's great value in having a really nice document to share and, you know, whether it's through the Farmers Market Association or, you know, the other ways that we could reach a new farmer mm -hmm. in the beginning, it seems that it would have real value to prevent future problems. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and Sue, one, one thought that comes to mind when you talk about the hoop houses or the hoop tunnels is then you've got a you've got a combination of the built environment and then a landscape, you know. So that you know you know, and whenever you have any aspect of the built environment, you got you've got collection of moisture, and and then that brings up a little bit how to manage that, like the runoff just from the from the from the tunnel, stuff like that. So that may that's just one thing that comes to mind to be be mindful of, and that could be also helpful about placement or trenching or things like that, or how to use that, you know, that collection of water to use uh, that comes in the rain, maybe for a later part of the year when you don't, you know, when, and it's sort of catchment or something like that. So there can be ways to just think about almost in a permacultural sort of way. Mm -hmm. Well, 
We are right up on our time. So I was going to open up if, if anybody. Oh, we did it? Yeah, we're, we're partying. Oh. Hey, let, let me see if I can just finish with this. Can I try to get that? That, that um, Yeah. The, um, um, if I think I had it here, where is it? Well, well, Kevin does that. I want to just uh, let folks know um, Sue and I are, are hopefully going to start uh, an Alaska farmer focus group um, to talk about and explore this more this fall. So um, we, we will make sure folks know about that um, if and when that happens. So fingers crossed, we're going to keep pushing this along and um, yeah. Kevin, was it the video that you had sent Sue and I? Yeah, are you, are you seeing it now? Are you seeing a video? Um, we are not. You have to share your screen again, so. Oh gosh, okay, I thought I, okay. So okay. many tech okay. skills, right? Can you see it? No. Nope. No? It doesn't look like you've shared your screen yet. Yeah, I thought I did, but um, I'm trying to do it. It's up. A... Oh, here we go. Are you seeing it now? It's, oh yeah, there we go. Okay, all right. Let's see if we can do it here. Well, salmon and orcas are not only part of our environment and our ecology, which is a very important thing, they're a huge part of our community. There's everything from the fishmongers at Pike Place to the commercial fishermen that make a living off of it to the Native American tribes who are spiritually connected to the orcas and the salmon. People are starting to look in a mirror a little bit more and think about their values and the choices that they're making and how where you live impacts not just yourself because you're living there, but impacts the environment. There are a lot of facets of our business that we had never really thought of until Salmon Safe came along and introduced some of these principles. The Salmon Safe certifications really opened up a collaboration opportunity with us, our clients, and our design teams to really deliver ecologically restorative projects. What makes Salmon Safe unique is that it's not a checklist when it comes to certification. We really do approach each project in a different way because every project is unique from the drawings to the planning, the actual development, construction, operations. Salmon Safe exists to extend a carrot to those who do want to follow the law. And in fact, even to go farther. Our standards are beyond code. They are pretty extensive. They're comprehensive. They cover all the areas that affect salmon, how well they can thrive in their habitat, what is needed to protect them and to recover them. Every one of our buildings is covered in green roof. So that's the first step for us as far as water processing. Then as you move down the building with our decks and the plaza and all those areas, we have a very complicated system of bioswales, taking all that water, cleaning it, and then sending it off. We've made it important that all of our development managers, and, and construction managers, and the broader group of the team are trained in what Santa Safe is. We have 17 properties certified at this point. Every property that we develop, and it's been a great partnership with Salmon Safe, with our partners, becoming certified. They work with other developers in the industry who are not necessarily certified, but those principles carry over. We believe that it's really forcing the industry forward by hopefully being the leader in this. For Unico, it's important to partner with expert organizations like Sam and Safe to help take the extensive and emerging research on this topic and translate it into actions that we can implement. I think when you prioritize smart, sustainable design, you're doing right for your tenants, for your future tenants, for your investors, for the community and the neighborhood. And I think that's what matters. That's part of what sustainability is, is creating something that has a lasting impact and is improving our planet. I really think about the beauty and the iconic nature of the Puget Sound and our local watersheds. Integral to that beauty is very much the health of our salmon populations, the health of our orca populations, the health of the marine life that we find in this region. Salmon Safe has given us great guidance and tools to make sure that we are protecting those local watersheds. The Salmon Safe theme is becoming 
more and more recognizable in the Northwest. And it's something that we like to promote. For us, it's doing the right thing. We did it, huh? We Can did it. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and I would suspect that there's there's a uh, in some of those buildings there there might be customers of uh, Sager's wine, too. <laughs> probably, probably. <laughs> yeah. or future customers. They they don't know it yet. That's a lot of what we'd like to do is they, they get this salmon safe also getting a sense of a community and to support each other. So the urban folks can say, oh, if I'm gonna buy wine, oh gosh, you know, let's connect with uh, Salmon Safe College and stuff like that. So th then, then the magic happens, yeah. Yeah, the Seattle, the Seattle people get it. <laughs> they're, they're salmon people for sure. Yeah. I really appreciate, Sager, your comments on, on voting with our dollars and backing up our, our values with, with how we're spending our, our money and our building, building stronger local economies at the same time. So thank you for that. And thank you, Kevin, for being here and Sue, as always, um, and everyone else that attended. I'm sure lots and lots of folks will be reviewing this recording as well. I know it's a hard ass to have uh, folks come right at happy hour uh, towards the end of the week, but um, know that this video will be um, viewed by lots of Alaskans looking to get yep. more information. So thank you Great. all very much. Thank and stay you. Good. come on down fly fishing. Or come yeah. up actually. Well, someday, someday. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.